Thank you. I didn't know you get that many sounds out of bells by smacking them on the table. But that's cool. I'm still just processing that. I didn't see what you're doing right because I'm sitting behind you, and then all of a sudden I was looking through, and they're smacking the table with those things. That's cool. I'm glad that you're here. Hey, this has been quite the journey this year, and I've appreciated being with you and enjoyed uh, working with uh, different, different departments of your church and um, kind of growing together, uh, so to speak. It's been, been kind of fun for me. And so we come down to uh, one of the craziest election seasons I've ever seen. Yeah, a real understatement. Uh, and I'm trying not to overstate that. But it simply tells me that we are one day closer to Jesus coming. <laughs> and these are scary times that we live in. And that tells me that we are one day closer to Jesus coming. You can look anywhere you want, and the obvious message that you have to come away with, whether it be the internet, the newspapers, the television, anywhere you want to look, just going downtown Chattanooga, you will see that we are closer now than we've ever been to Jesus coming. And, and like Nate said in his prayer, we kind of sometimes wonder, why haven't you come yet? But that's what the disciples were wondering back in the early days. That's what they were saying when the Romans began the persecutions and when millions were killed. They were saying, why hasn't he come yet? That's what the people who are over in other countries being persecuted for the mere fact that they're Christians are saying. You know, we've got it pretty good. We really do. And though we sit here fearing about everything under the sun, we really have it pretty good. But I got a message for you because we're not done yet. How do I know? Because God hasn't come yet. And Jesus isn't here. Which means that there's one primary message we need to continue to proclaim, and that is Hold on. So before we get into Scripture today, let's hold on and have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the promises of Scripture. We thank you that you have promised no matter what happens that you'll be with us, Jesus, to the very end. And so help us to hold on to those promises, to hold on to you. And Father, as we open your word this morning, you've promised that you will send your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, to give us understanding. May it be proclaimed in power today, not through my words, but through the power of your Spirit. May our hearts resonate and resound with the good tidings that Jesus is on his way in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. If I were a betting man, and I'm a preacher, so I don't, I would bet that most of you, if not all of you, have seen this chapter before. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 14. Now, I'm going to put it on the screen so that we can actually read this. Oh, we're the same problem. This thing did it again. Okay. Okay. For those of you who complained last time, hold on. When I plugged this in last time, it took the size of my fonts way down, and I didn't fix it last time, and I went all the way through the sermon, and I heard about it. So I'm going to take just a few seconds and reset this back to the big fonts so you old people can see this, okay? <laughs> um, 
Hold on. You like that? Nope, that's not the right one. I'm getting there. Oh, that's it. Okay, now we can go. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am Messiah. They will, what's that word? Deceive many. Oh, but not you, because you're Seventh-day Adventist. You can't be deceived. You guys know your stuff. Let's go on. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. You hear that? Seen any of those? But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Well, we've been doing the wars and rumors of wars for quite a while now, so we know we've been there. Nation will go to war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Have you seen that happen? Okay. Check that one off. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, when we were pregnant with our first child, Andrea, I remember very vividly the morning. You know, I'm talking about the morning. It was 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was doing what you're supposed to do, sound asleep. And I was doing it well, I might add. I mean, there's sometimes people say, did you sleep good? And I said, no, I made a few mistakes. But some of you guys will get that later. <laughs> this afternoon, you'll be sitting there going, oh, I get those. I was doing it well this particular morning, and all of a sudden, my wife sat straight up, and she said, it's time. Now, in my foggy brain, I went, time. Time. She's not sitting still. She's leaping out of bed. Something is happening within her that says, it's now time. Nothing is happening within me to say that. <laughs> I'm thinking it's time for you to be quiet and let me go back to sleep. She's going around the foot of the bed. She smacks me in the legs and says, it's time. Suddenly, Somewhere in the fog, an arrow pierced through and said, time, ding, 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 ding. Oh, it's, oh, I was suddenly, instantly out of bed. I jumped up, man, I'm throwing my clothes on. We had this little bag packed, ready to go to the hospital. Had a roll of quarters for the vending machines like they told us to. And, I mean, now you can just take your card and swipe it. But back then you couldn't, it was quarters. And, and I was ready. It was time. She goes and gets in the shower. I thought you said it was time. So I'm thinking, she got time for a shower. I got time for some toaster waffles, you know? So I went in and grabbed some freezer waffles. I put those babies in the toaster, and I'm standing there waiting. Bing, they pop up. She comes rushing through, fully dressed with the case, everything. She's ready to go. It's time. And I went, but my wa waffles. I grabbed the waffles, we ran out, we jumped in the car, we raced because we had a 40-minute drive to the hospital. We raced. I was just daring a cop to stop me because I was going to say, it's time. <laughs> it's coming. I, I was thinking these thoughts like, you know, the baby's going to be born in the car and mess up my floor mats or whatever, you know. <laughs> it's time. And, and so we are racing to the hospital. Nobody stopped it because it was 4 o'clock in the morning. And so we come racing into the hospital lot, and, and I went around to the door where I knew we had been there and visited earlier and seen the little tour and everything. And we went racing in at my toaster waffles. I just <laughs> threw them on the dashboard. I did go back out later after the sun. I heated them back up and ate those because I was hungry. But... <laughs> We sat there for 12 hours. 
I thought you said it was time. Well, she was ready, and I was ready. But if you know anything about babies, they got their own time. It wasn't quite time. All of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then, oh, here comes the fun part. You will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. I don't like this part of Scripture. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Why did you tell us all this, Jesus? That just freaks me out. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. That's already happening in the church. Not this church. Other churches run a conference where I go. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. Have you noticed that happening in our world today? Do you see the love of many? There, there just seems to be a common hatred and anger persistent in society today, isn't there? There's so much of it that there, some candidates can even build a platform on it. I won't say anything else. But the one who endures to the end, what are those words? Will be. Now let me ask you a question. Enduring to the end, is that dependent on you or on him? See, here's the problem, fellow Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Too many times we read this passage as if all of this depends on us. We read these words and we get freaked out. Or the King James would say that we freaketh out if. Um, we read these words and we get freaked out and we say, oh man, I gotta do something. I gotta get ready. You heard those words? We gotta get ready. We gotta get serious. We gotta, and we start thinking of all the things we gotta do. And so what we start doing is we start going and we start building underground cellars and we start putting things in it and we go out and we take wild edible courses. And I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm just saying when you start depending on you, you stop depending on God. When you stop depending on God, you are already in, as my father used to say, very deep weeds. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then, let's say it together, the end will come. Now, how many of those signs have we not seen? There's only one that hasn't totally been completed. What is it? The good news of the kingdom being preached to all the world. Now, we're preaching in all parts of the world. But we haven't preached to all the world. But guess what? That doesn't even depend on us. What depends on us is being faithful to where God has called us to serve and minister. Amen. And if each of us is taking a personal responsibility for being obedient to what Christ is calling us to do right here, right now, he will magnify that, and he will make this happen. Amen. It's not about us. It's always about Jesus. Amen. The sad thing is we spend far too much time strategizing. We spend far too much time watching signs. I wish I could tell you the emails that I get whenever the Pope raises his right hand. I'm being a little facetious, but not really. I get so many emails about whatever the Pope does this and the Pope does that and, and about this sign and that sign. The fact is, if we're going to follow Scripture, we don't need any more signs. They've all been fulfilled. Everything that happens now is simply a repeating of the signs that have been happening for years. We don't need to watch for more signs to happen to know that Jesus is coming soon. As a matter of fact, you would have to be pretty, I'll be polite, dense, 
not to understand that something is going on in this world right now, wouldn't you? We don't need any more sign watchers in the church. What we need are people who stop watching signs and turn their attention to watching the Savior. See, whenever I get this idea and I read Scripture and I've got to try to fulfill it myself, I then begin to stop watching the Savior and I start watching all the signs. Jesus never gave us the signs for us to be fixated on them. He gave us the signs to point us back to following Him. And so we spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of freaking out Work, but how we're going to stand in the last days, how we're going to do this, and how we're going to do that, and we strategize, and we, we, we buy different things, and we try to, that's, let me put it this way, the only way to get ready is to live ready. You live ready by choosing to trust in every circumstance. Oh, here's where we got a problem. When I went big, it killed, it went off the page here. The most important question you have to answer, I forgot what it was. No, I didn't. But, but you can't read it now. That's cool. I get to lead you through this. Is the question that Jesus asks you every day, will you trust me even here? See, this whole thing has always been about faith walking. It's always been about walking in step with God in faith. It's never been about me trying to make it through. Well, but pastor, it says to him who endures, yeah, you're not even having to do the enduring. Jesus will help you with that. He's saying that trial you have in your life today Will you trust me with that? You have a decision to make. Yes or no? Well, I don't know, God. I mean, if you really understood the trials, I'm going, really? The question is simple. Will you trust me here? And you say, yes. That death you experienced in your family, that tragedy... God says, will you trust me even here? Job answered the question, even if you slay me, yet will I trust you. Will you trust me here? See, the whole faith walk is about learning that God is trustworthy. Learning for yourself that you can trust God in any and every situation. It's learning that God means what he says. And that when he says it, he will do it. Amen. And so you have that question, question to answer. Will you trust me here? It's a faith walk. God says, those bills you have to pay, will you trust me? Will you trust that I can provide? Yeah, but I'm going to go ahead and apply for that loan. Maybe that's how he wants to provide, but Sometimes I think we jump into things too quickly without letting him lead us in that. And so he says today, whatever you're facing, will you trust me here? You say yes. Then he moves and he says, now, today, will you trust me here? You have a decision to make again. It's the same question every day. It's the same question every trial. It's the same question every loss. It's the same question every time he comes to you. He says, will you trust me here? And you have to make a decision, yes or no. And the way you make decisions will make it easier or harder in the future to trust him. If you keep trying to make your own way, well, Lord, I trust you, but I've got to do this. Well, Lord, I trust you, but I've got to do this. Well, Lord, I trust you, but not really. Well... Uh, and we finally come to the point of saying, well, no, I really don't. Now, lest some of you say, well, pastor, but you can't be presumptuous. I understand that. 
I'm not talking about presumption. I'm talking about faith, which is belief based on evidence. And so God says to you, will you trust me? And we're going to look at this in just a minute in Scripture. And I have to make that decision, yes, I will. And then things move, will you trust me here? And I have to make a decision again today, yes, I will. And then he says, will you trust me here? Yes, I will. Will you trust me here? Yes, I will. Will you trust me here? Yes, I will. Welcome to the kingdom. You have just faith walked with Jesus right on into the kingdom. And the only question you and I have to answer daily is, will you trust me here? And if we're learning to trust Jesus in our day-to-day -day activities, we have nothing to fear for what will come. Because he says, lo, I'm with you, what's that word? Always. Always. Even to the end of the age. I will be with you. Do you trust me? We let so many things capture our imaginations, and we fear. We worry. Sometimes we worry so much that when we have nothing to worry about, we worry that we're not worrying about something. But we worry. So I started looking at this faith walk and saying, okay, so how does this work? And I began going back through Scripture, and I began looking at different biblical characters. I came to, to Joseph. You remember Joseph. He was, he was born and became his father's favorite because he was born of his father's favorite wife. And, and he had so many brothers, they didn't really like him, and he had dreams, and they didn't like his dreams, and he got a coat of many colors, and they didn't like his coat. And, and he, he began trying to tell them that, you know, you guys are going to bow down to me because my dream said so. And they're like, no, I uh, don't think so. And then they saw him coming across the field one day and said, here comes this dreamer. And they threw him in a pit intending to kill him. But then they thought, you know, murder, that's kind of drastic. Let's just sell him as a slave. So as the traders came by, they sent him to Egypt as a slave. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Now, you can say, well, you know, that's not so bad. He could have been killed. True. So slavery killed. But some consider slavery to be a living death because you are always being killed. But Ellen White says that Joseph determined as he passed by the hills that just over the other side of the hill were his father's tents. They went right back by there. He knew he would never, probably ever see his father again. And it says he determined in his heart that he would be faithful to God in every circumstance. He made a decision. He said, yes, Lord, I will trust you wherever this path goes. I don't know what's coming. Well, you know the story. He so distinguished himself in Potiphar's house that before long, he was over everything that Potiphar owned. And then Potiphar's wife said, behold, he looketh good. He looketh very good. And she said, Joseph, come spend some special time with me. And Joseph said, I don't think so. And said she took a hold of him and tried to drag him to her room. And he pulled his arms out of his jacket and he fled. And then she turned the tables on him and she said, this Hebrew slave came and attacked me. And he left this. Now, do you think Potiphar believed her? If Potiphar had believed her, he had the right to kill him instantly. And nobody would have said a word. Potiphar sent him to jail. Imagine Joseph. He's finally worked his way up. He's feeling pretty good about life. I can do this. This is good. Now he's in jail as a political prisoner. He's back at the bottom again. I imagine he was pretty disappointed. I imagine his emotions were, were pretty rough. But he said, as he heard God speaking to him, do you trust me, Joseph, even here? Yes, God, I do. And Joseph was faithful. And you know the story. It wasn't long before the jailer began to notice him, and the jailer began to, to let him have more freedoms. And the jailer ended up putting him in charge of the whole jail. 
gospel. And then you have the story of the baker and the butler that got put into jail, and they had dreams, and Joseph interpreted the dreams, and he said to the uh, butler, please don't forget me when you get back there. Oh, I won't, Joseph. You can count on me. I'm your guy. I'll be there for you. Just, you can count on me. Two more years he sat there. One day, Pharaoh had a dream. Didn't know how to interpret it. And the butler goes, oh, I meant to tell you. <laughs> there was this guy when I was in jail who interprets dreams. And yeah, I think he could, he could probably handle this one. Well, Colin, none of my wives men to be able to handle it. No, no, I, I seriously think he can. So he calls him. And Joseph rightly says, no, I can't interpret your dream, but the God I serve can. See, too many times we try to take credit for what God has already done. And before he could even breathe, he was second in command of all of Egypt. Now that is a rags to riches story. You're going from the dungeon to having everybody in the entire kingdom bow down to you. That's a fairly significant jump, wouldn't you say? God says, will you trust me here? Will you trust me here? Will you trust me here? Oh, by the way, I have this ready for you. Boom. But I think God asked the same question. When he put him in command, he said, will you trust me here, Joseph? Or will you take credit for it? Yeah, I'm a, great, uh, I'm a great dream interpreter. Hang out my shingle. See, God can't trust you and I with the big stuff if we haven't learned to trust him in the small stuff that goes before. Amen. Then you read over a little further and you come to this guy named Moses about 400 years later. You know the story. He was... He was in. A, a, an infant put into a little boat out in the bulrushes and, and the king's daughter found him. And she said, I want to raise this as my own kid. And Miriam comes out and you know that whole deal, how it worked out. So first 12 years he's home and then he's into the palace and he's there for 40 years. And then he has this altercation between he and an Egyptian that's beaten one of his Hebrew brothers. He ends up killing him. He comes back the next day and says, Brothers, you shouldn't be fighting between two Hebrew brothers. And they said, you're going to kill us like you did the guy yesterday? He knew he was in trouble. By that time, word was out, we're after Moses, find him. Moses fled. Next 40 years, 40 years, he's watching sheep. I can't think of anything I would like to do less than watch sheep. You ever watch sheep? Those are dumb animals. I mean, it's like there's a, there's a lead sheep. I don't know how they determine who that is. I don't think his name is Sean. But there's a lead sheep. Those of you little kids understand that one. Um, and somehow the, this idea pops in lead sheep's mind. Let's go over here. And so all the other sheep will be, 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 be right up. We just follow him. Doesn't matter what they do. Oh, we're going over here. Oh, okay, we're going over here. That's why they need a shepherd to say, follow me. He's out there watching his sheep one day, and all of a sudden he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not burning. Think about that. Moses did. He said, hey, there's a bush that's burning, but it's not burning. How is that possible? It should be being consumed. So he goes over, and all of a sudden a voice comes out of the bush, Moses. That would freak you out, wouldn't it? Moses, take off your shoes. The place you're standing is holy ground. Moses rips off his shoes. He's on his face. And God says, I want you to go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> and Moses said, no. No can do. God's asking Moses a question. Can you trust me here? No. <laughs> no. See, God, what you don't understand about Pharaoh, he wants to kill me. Okay, and all he has to do is just wave his hand like this, and I'm done. It's just, you know, God says, I'll go with you. I'll protect you. In other words, Moses, will you trust me here? 
Well, 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 because uh, but, 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 uh, I, 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 I stutter. And God said, I made your tongue, Moses. I can take that stutter all the way out. Will you trust me here? Whoa, 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 whoa. I forgot, forgot the language. My brother Aaron knows the language really good. Okay, I'll let you hook up with Aaron. Will you trust me here? I'm not sure. See, doubting is normal. Hedging is normal for us as humans because we haven't learned to faith walk perfectly. Moses hadn't learned it either. Thank you for putting that in there, God, because that gives me hope. But once he got a hold of it, oh, the next 40 years he faith walked. You can't lead 2 million people through the wilderness without faith walking. Wow. 2 million people just trying to feed and water them and their cattle would be huge. You go a little farther. And you come to a guy named Elijah. And there was a wicked king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. And they led the people in the worship of Baal. We say Baal in the south, same thing. Which meant God of fire and rain. Which suddenly makes those tests make sense, doesn't it? God said, it's not going to rain until I say so. Oh, no, no, Baal's got this. Well, you got prophets, we can, we can pray to him and he'll make it rain. Three and a half years later, it's not raining. Elijah shows up and Ahab says, is that you, troubler of Israel? You're the one that caused this mess? We're all dying here. You guys think the drought in North Georgia and Southern Tennessee is bad? You haven't seen nothing until three and a half years, just not a drop of rain. So Baal fails the test of uh, weather, doesn't he? God wanted to demonstrate that he wasn't in charge of the lightning either. So Elijah says, I want to meet you guys and all your prophets up on the top of the mountain. And there is 450 prophets of Baal up there. And he says, what I want to do is I want to build two altars. We'll put wood on them, the stones, the wood. We'll put our sacrifice on them. And then the God who answers by fire, he's God. And so he let them go all day. And I really like the Bible in this particular case because the Bible gives a little bit of excuse for sarcasm. And that's one of my native spiritual gifts. Um, I think Elijah had a touch of it. Because he's up on the mountain and these guys are dancing, trying to, to figure out some way to get fire underneath there to prove to the people that their God is God. And he's going, well, maybe he's sleeping. Yell louder. <laughs> They're yelling louder. Oh, wait, wait. Was this the time he was scheduled to be on vacation? Maybe that's where he's at. He's on vacation, can't hear you. Yell louder. They're yelling louder. Oh, maybe, he, maybe he's just, uh, and the Bible says he's relieving himself. Like, what? Elijah, man, you got some guts. 450 of them, and you're making fun of their God? After all day, nothing happening. They've cut themselves. They're bleeding profusely. They're exhausted. They can't dance around their altar anymore. And it came time for the evening sacrifice. And Elijah says, can you guys get those water jars over there? And fill them up. I want you to pour them over. So while they're going to get the thing, he digs a trench around his altar. They come and pour water. He said, can you do that again? Now, I don't know about you, but you're on the top of a mountain. The closest water is going to be down at the bottom by the sea. Can you imagine those poor servants? Go up and down the mountain like three times. Finally, he says, okay, people draw close. Oh, God, I know that you hear me. But to show that you are God of all of Israel, show this people... And before he can say amen, 
the fire falls. And it not only consumes the sacrifice and the wood, it consumes the stones. And the Bible says it licked up the water in the trenches. It is gone. Wow, wouldn't that make a great movie? And the people said, the Lord, he is God. Well, duh. You'd have said that too. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And they're crying, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah going, finally. And then the Bible said he went off to pray. And he prayed for rain. And he prayed how many times? And on the seventh time as he's praying, he sends his servant back out to look, and the servant comes back and says, well, there's this little teeny cloud, size of about man's hand. And he said, you go tell Ahab to hook his chariots up and get down the mountain because he's about to be caught in the most serious rainstorm of his life. In fact, the Bible says, there is the sound of much rain in my ears. And that's exactly what happened. Ahab stayed at the picnic a little too long. Finally hooked up his horse and started down. By the time he got there, this little cloud had expanded and exploded. And it was coming down so hard they couldn't see. And then it says, Elijah, this just blows my mind, ran down and caught up with the horses of Ahab and led them down the mountain, out running the horses. That would make a good movie. Wow. In the rain, blinding him, he's running, pulling the horses down. The horses are going, dude, I hope you know where you're going. We had not got a clue. But Elijah gave, uh, God gave Elijah that supernatural sight that cuts through all that stuff. They ran down to the city, and he let the horses go on through the gates. He didn't go in. The Bible says he went out and went to sleep under a juniper tree. Apparently, motels were few and far between. I don't know. Juniper tree. And Ahab goes, and he is stoked, because what had happened, uh, he had seen the Lord, he is God. He would seen all the people respond to that. He would seen the power. And then Elijah had said, capture all the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them escape. God has said they need to be put to death. And they were all put to death. And so Elijah, uh, Ahab goes in. And he starts saying, Jezebel says, how'd it go? How was your day, dear? Let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, there's prophets of Baal. They're jokes, seriously. They dance around, cut themselves, nothing. But Elijah just said one little prayer. <clears throat> and all the people, the Lord, he is God. Lord, he's God. What about my prophets? Oh, those jokes? Yeah, what about them? Oh, <laughs> we, uh, <coughs> You what? Well, Elijah said we should. You what? We, <clears throat> we, we, we killed them. All 450? Yeah, there's none of them there anymore. It's fine. And Jezebel goes into a fury. The book Prophet King says. And I can imagine she reaches out into the hallway and she grabs one servant and just rips him in and says, you go tell Elijah that his life is going to be like the life of my prophets tomorrow. You got it? You got it. Go. Elijah gets awakened. Let's just pick up the story in 1 Kings. When, Elijah, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. Whoops. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was, what's that word? afraid and fled for his life. Doesn't that just blow your mind? He is fearless in front of 450 prophets of Baal and all the people of Israel, but one woman sends a death threat. He's out of there. Why? 
because physical burnout, he hadn't had anything to eat or drink pretty much all day. Physical burnout will always lead to spiritual burnout. He's exhausted. He's human. He went to the town of Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. One day he stands in front of the prophets of Baal and all the people of Israel. The next he ran. Now, I'm going to have to change back real quickly because this is, there's a whole lot more and it's way off the screen and I don't remember all this from memory. But it won't take me long. There we go. Elijah should not have fled from his post of duty. He should have met the threat of Jezebel with an appeal for protection to the one who had commissioned him to vindicate the honor of Jehovah. God said, will you trust me here, Elijah? He said, yes. Will you trust me here, Elijah? He said, yes. Will you trust me here, Elijah? Yes. Will you trust me here? No. That woman is nuts. I can't trust you with her. And he ran. Elijah should not have fled from his post of duty. He should have met the threat of Jezebel with an appeal for protection to the one who had commissioned him to vindicate the honor of Jehovah. He should have told the messenger that the God in whom he trusted would protect him against the hatred of the queen. Only a few hours had passed since he had witnessed a wonderful manifestation of divine power, and this should have given him assurance that he would not now be forsaken. We have nothing to fear for the future except that we, what? Forget. forget how God has led in the past. He forgot. Had he remained where he was, had he made God his refuge and strength, standing steadfast for the truth, he would have been shielded from harm. But he didn't. Because he was human. And praise the Lord, this story was included in the Bible for you and me. Amen. Because sometimes we forget, don't we? We forget and we panic. We forget and we, we start getting freaked out about things. The Lord would have given him another signal victory by sending his judgments on Jezebel and the impression made on the king and the people would have wrought a great reformation. Elijah blew it. You ever blown it? How did God deal with Elijah? Well, eventually, but I'm talking about right after this. He let him sleep, and then he woke him up and fed him and let him sleep again because God knows we're more human than we think we are. He knew he needed rest. He needed food. He woke him up a second time and fed him, and it says on that food he traveled 40 days across to the mountain where he met God. And that's where God recommissioned him, and God resent him out. He saw the wind, the fire, the earthquake, but God wasn't there. And then the still, small voice came, and it says he covered his face with his cloak. He knew he was in the presence of God. Sometimes, folks, we need to pull off to the side of the road, and we start feeling panicked, and we need to reconnect with that still, small voice. Amen. We need to listen once again and get the reassurance that God can still bring signal victories in our lives and the lives of those around. We need to pull over to the side of the road, get our rest. We need to make sure that we're not so distorted in our thinking that we have to do everything and God does nothing. Because that's not a God follower, that's a me follower. That's a very dangerous place to be. God understands that fear is very much a part of our journey here. He understands that what we need to do more than anything else is to hold on. He understands that we need a God. We need a God. We're made to worship. Did you know that? 
We're made to worship, and we will worship something. We'll either worship God or worship all those things that we ascribe worth to, be it our car, our home, a football team. We will worship something. And you can tell what you worship by what you talk about. God had to remind Elijah that he was still in control, that he was still taken care of. Last story. Jesus lived his life in implicit trust in his Father. One last story, Mark chapter 4. This was our scripture reading today. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. Can't always outrun the crowds. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Now that just blows my mind. You ever been on the lake in a storm? When I was a kid, we had this boat. We go to Lake Powell every year because we lived in Arizona, and 2,000 miles of shoreline, big open area. And I remember we got into a storm out there in the lake one day. We saw it coming, and we tried to get back. Before we knew what had happened, this storm was on us, and we were in four to six foot standing waves. And at one point, we're looking at the sky. The next point, we're looking at the, at the water. And my youngest sister was sitting in the, in the bow of the boat, and, and my mom said, I want you to come back here and sit with me. And she was probably six years old, seven years old. She got up to start coming back through. And at that time, we went under, the, the bow went under a wave. And I remember the wave just washing my sister all the way through the boat. Now, I was sitting at the very back of the boat, holding on for dear life. And I just watched as she was swept through the boat on this wave. And I reached over, and I grabbed a hold of her life jacket as the wave went through. And then she just plopped on the floor. And then I handed her to mom. I cannot imagine sleeping in a storm like that. I cannot imagine it one bit. Water has to be going over Jesus. He is so exhausted, he's asleep. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? This is one of the dumbest questions in all of Scripture. Do you think he cared? The book Desire of Ages says his eye was ever, this is a different storm now, his eye was ever upon the men in that boat for these were the men that would take his message to the world. Don't you care if we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm and then Jesus had a question of his own. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see the two polar opposites? There's fear and there's faith. You can't live in both. Scripture says perfect love casts out all what? Fear. If you're on the edge of fear all the time in your life, it's because you have turned your eyes away from the Savior and you're watching the signs. You've turned your eyes away from Jesus and you're watching all the different things that cause you trouble. He says, turn your eyes back to me. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Will you trust me even here? Now the disciples have another response. The disciples were absolutely terrified. They thought they knew the man in the back of the boat. (laughs) Now they're saying, who is this man? We thought the storm freaked us out, but to have somebody who can control the storm, that freaks me out more. Even the wind and waves obey him. Who is this man? See, sometimes we're in the middle of our storms, we forget that we have Jesus in the boat. He's back there all the time. And we forget, and then we say, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Dumbest question ever. Of course he does. 
Can he calm your storm? Absolutely. But sometimes he doesn't choose to. Sometimes he just chooses to calm your heart. But he can't do either unless you go back to him and you hold on to him. And when you see that power portrayed in your life, you say, who is this man? Notice this. Another quote by Ellen. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. Why? He trusted implicitly in the Father's care. He knew God had a plan for him, and if God said, now's the time that you die, he was okay with that. But he knew that God had a purpose for him. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. Oh, yeah, but he was God. No, she says, that's not it. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he laid down. And he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith. Faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. Can you and I rest in faith? Faith in God's love and care? It means that I answer the question today, will you trust me here, God? Or God says, will you trust me here? And I have to say, I don't know. I've got to make that decision. Yes, I can trust you here. Then tomorrow, another trial comes, another... Thing hits you, another bad news comes, and you say, he says, will you trust me here? I've got a decision to make. Yes or no? Do I trust by faith in God's love and care that he loves me, he cares for me? If I'm watching signs, I sure don't, because what I'm doing is I'm freaking out. I'm watching the signs. I don't know how I'm going to make it. It's all about me. See, we have this natural thing I call ingrown eyeballs. As soon as you take your eyes off Jesus, it begins to come right back around to me. I have to ever check where I'm looking. I have to always be aware of where my attention is. Am I re-diverting my attention away from Jesus, or am I locked and loaded? Am I focused on Him? I need to hold on. So I want to challenge you Stanford Gap Church, hold on. To hold on is not so much about bravery and courage, but it's a learned response from a long obedience in the same direction. It's about being confident in the one who has called you. So hold on, church. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your desire to engage young people. Hold on to your desire to work with young families. Hold on to your care for one another. But most importantly, hold on to Jesus. Amen. See, being ready for the end of times is more about learning how to trust Jesus with your life today. And then today. And then today. It's a faith walk that happens daily, not something that's going to happen out there at some point in time. If you're not preparing today by answering the question, will you trust me even here? You're not going to be ready there. But if you're daily walking and you're saying, yes, I trust you, God. Do you trust me here? Yes, I trust you, God. Do you trust me here? Yes, I trust you, God. Do you trust me here? Yes, I trust you, God. Welcome to the kingdom. Come on in. Enjoy all this my Father's prepared for you. The only way you can get ready is to live ready. You live ready by choosing to trust in every circumstance. You learn to trust in every circumstance by answering the question with a resounding yes. Will you trust me even here? That's harder than it sounds. Because we don't like to be relying on someone else. But folks, the only way we'll make it is to rely fully and wholly on Jesus. Amen. Will you trust me even here. I hope and pray that you will. Let's pray. Father God, it is so hard with all the junk going on down here, the, the political storms, the, the different wars, the different everything that's going on, the political unrest, the, 
the social unrest, the hatred, the bigotry. But Lord, help us not to be so engulfed in all of that that we spend our time in fear. But rather, Lord, help us to be Savior watchers. Help us to come to the quietness of our very own heart and confront ourselves with a question. Can I truly trust God? And will I trust Him in this situation? And Lord, when we come to those situations, help us to answer with a resounding yes. Yes, God, I'll trust you here. I don't know that I can't see the way through. I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'll trust you, and I'll trust you to make the way. So, God, we want to once again commit ourselves to wholly relying on you and entrusting in you and allowing you to work in, through, and for us. So that on that day, when you come, we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for trusting me. And we go into your kingdom for eternity. May we find that peace in our hearts that comes only from trusting, that allows us to walk all the way through the troublesome times we're in with contentment and peace, knowing that Jesus himself said, you'll have trouble in the world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. May we rest in that knowledge today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Don. You have definitely challenged us to, to trust in the Lord. Today, if you're here and you've never, never made that decision to trust in Jesus all the way, total surrender, and you'd like to do that, at least you'd like to be identified. Um, you want more support. Pastor Ian and I and whoever else would join us would be happy to help you today in that journey. There's a little card in front of you in your pew, and you can fill that card out and just say, hey, Today, I, I started trusting Jesus, and I need support, and we'll do what we can to support you. So put that in the brown box, or you can give it to me personally. Um, I want to thank Pastor Don for challenging us in more ways than just what he preached on today. As some of you know, uh, because of his presence here uh, this year, we've been challenged to look at the area of youth and young adult ministry. And I would have to tell you, Pastor Don, that um, you have stirred our hearts, and, and we are definitely uh, looking at things that we can do to attract that segment of our population. Uh, Katie and Kenny have uh, put together some really wonderful stuff for the young adults, and some of you see that stuff in the bulletin. Uh, Pastor Ian is helping with our youth. Uh, so definitely God is doing some great things here at Standard for Gap. Now, I want you to know, some of you, I know you're visiting here today, and uh, so you may live from out of town, you be, you're coming from out of town, but if you are close, at least next Sabbath, I want to invite you to come. Here's why. Come back to church. I'm going to be preaching a sermon. It's entitled, The Faith of Desmond Doss. Some of you know, just yesterday, in the theaters around the country, even in Chattanooga, uh, the world is getting a chance to see this man in action, at least portrayed in a movie. Uh, well, there's books and stuff that have been put together uh, to help you know the rest of the story about Desmond Doss. Well, there's also a sermon. Yours truly is going to preach about that next week, and I want to invite you and invite your friends to come. Some of you know that Friday, Friday, this coming Friday is a special day, Veterans Day, when we remember those who have uh, served in the military, also those who are currently serving. And so next week, yeah, we're going to take some time to remember them, but also remember the faith of Desmond Doss. That's next week here at Standard for Gap uh, for our church worship time. I will also tell you that next Sabbath is a very special Sabbath. Jeff and Tina, Avery, and I are very close friends with a lady that had a baby that was about to die. God answered the prayer of, of many of you here in this church. The baby Jaden survived. He lived. And now he's going to get dedicated to the Lord here at our church next Sabbath. 
And so you've got to come and see that story. Robin, the mother, has agreed uh, to make this a, a special uh, thing for that little boy. And uh, boy, it's going to be really exciting. So yeah, if you're out of town, that's one thing. But if you're close to here, yeah, see if you can come next week and invite a friend. We're going to conclude today with uh, our closing hymn. Thank you so much, uh, Judy and John, for helping us with the music. We love the music of our church, and thank you for all those that help with that. 522, my hope is built on nothing less. You can join me here on the screen or go from your hymnal, whatever works for you. But please stand right now as we close our time together. Let's pray. Father, it has been so good to be in your house on your holy day. What a blessing it has been to be able to come and worship you today. We realize, Lord, that as we leave this building, we truly do, we truly do enter into your mission field to shine for you, Lord. And thank you that you've given us the privilege as a church, Lord, to be a part of those people that witness. And Lord, as we think about the times in which we live, we definitely want uh, to shine for you brightly. This is a very interesting time right now for our country, knowing that there's an interest in the story of Desmond Doss and his faith. I pray that you'll help us to be able to share our faith in the story of, of why Desmond Doss was so faithful, Lord, as we think about uh, this time that we're living in. We also want to thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the privilege to be able to have a wonderful message today that you spoke through your servant. Thank you for the bell choir and help us all to hold on is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.